um, I'd love you to uh, follow along with me. We're in page 560 in the Blue Bibles, Psalm 32. This is a Psalm of David. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him and whose spirit and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the, summer, as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave me. Uh, you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you while you may be found. Surely when the mighty waters rise, they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the man who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. Thanks, Jono. And we're um, praying the Psalms through summer. Uh, we've got one more Psalm next week. Shady will be back and he'll be preaching through that Psalm. And then in term one, we're going to be preaching through Mark's Gospel uh, from um, the beginning of, of term one through to Easter. But for now, we're in the, the Psalms and we're praying this Psalm. It's a Psalm of forgiveness. So let's, uh, let's come before the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you that you're a forgiving God and that uh, you've penned in the Psalms through David, offering a, a, often a pouring out of the heart in repentance and then a rejoicing in the assurance of forgiveness. And Lord, as we um, spend some time here in David's Psalm of Forgiveness, Father, we pray that you would so attune our hearts to his, uh, which is really attuning our hearts to that of the Lord Jesus who came into the world for the forgiveness of sins who was raised from the dead for our justification. Help us to treasure and to value everything that we have in him, that we too might be people of repentance and rejoicing. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If we were to say uh, of people, they were truly blessed, uh, what do we mean when we say that? What do we mean that they were blessed? I think it can mean a whole lot of different things depending on the context uh, that we're using it in language. So when we came back from two weeks holiday, uh, we could say we were truly blessed with the weather. And what that means is that generally the sun was shining uh, for us in holiday time anyway, that the wind was calm, it meant that we had plenty of time outside as a family, just hanging together, very warm, very comfortable uh, in the outdoor environment. Now, uh, if people were camping in Victoria this week, they might have gone home thinking that they weren't terribly blessed uh, by the weather. We had a few storms rolling through, didn't we? A bit of wind and a bit of rain, quite unusual uh, for summer in Victoria. Uh, you might feel blessed with a particular workplace or friendship group or a team or a, or a particular cohort at school. Your peers or your colleagues, when you get together, you have great conversation, you're committed to one another, you care for one another. There's often a few laughs and uh, you share tears together as well. You're blessed by the company of friends that you have. Um, we're anticipating Australia Day later this week, and I often think that I'm blessed uh, to be born and raised in Australia. Uh, we have inherited almost 250 years of relative peace and prosperity, uh, firstly off the back of the sheep and the wheat crop, uh, and now also off the back of the mining boom. Um, Australia is a place that is blessed. Uh, we have, it's a place of beauty. Uh, we have very great weather on the whole. Mostly our climates are good. We have pockets of like cyclones and fires and floods but if you don't uh, live in those places if you live in the great southwest of Victoria uh, you are blessed so we use this word blessed in a whole lot of different contexts um, and others uh, will 
who don't actually acknowledge God, they'll see themselves as lucky maybe. They won't use that word blessed, but they think, oh, we're lucky with the weather, lucky to be in community that we find ourselves in, lucky to be born in this country. But we see it as a gift of the hand of God. There's one context that the Bible continues to return to when it speaks about being blessed, and that is the forgiveness of sins. Uh, It is the focal point of blessing for the people of God. And uh, David recognizes that. Here in Psalm 32, um, he says in verse 1, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them. There it is, the forgiveness of sins. Or the way it's also expressed in these opening two verses is sins being covered or when sin is not counted against us. Three times over in those opening verses expressed in different ways, the forgiveness of sins. It's a major theme, actually, in the book of Psalms. There are a number of Psalms known as Psalms of Confession or Penitential Psalms. If you're writing notes, I'll give you just six others, Uh, six 38, 51, 102, 130, and 143. You can look them up later, maybe read through them. Uh, Number 51 is actually the most commonly known, isn't it? It's uh, the psalm where David is repenting because of his sin with Bathsheba and his murdering of Bathsheba's husband Uriah. Um, Very commonly known. Later in the sermon, we're going to come back to what exactly is this forgiveness of sins and how can we experience it. But but firstly, let's just have a look at the immediate context that sort of provides the grounds for the blessing that forgiveness is. And that immediate context is the burden that comes with broken relationship with God due to unconfessed sin. So have a look in verse 3. David says, When I kept silent... My bones wasted away through groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. There are a few really graphic descriptions here, aren't there? Uh, David says, my bones wasted away. Now you've got to put yourself in a thousand year before Christ medical context, okay? The medical... uh, Industry and the technology and understanding hasn't progressed that far. And when you say, my bones have wasted away, what you're saying is that there is deep, there is a lot of pain deep within my body that is completely inescapable. And it feels like decay in my bones or a wasting of the bones. Because they thought that the innermost part of their body was the bones. Everything else went around that. In in a way, they're right. And a decay in the bones or the bones wasting away left you without energy, feeling constantly weak, groaning on your bed day and night. It's as if you are close to death. You can see in verse 5, he says, My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. There's no air conditioning in 1000 BC. Uh, This is how David felt when he was silent before God and burdened by unconfessed sin. A little bit how I felt uh, just in, in the last week with an infection close to my bone. Thankfully, had an ultrasound on Tuesday, didn't get into the bone. And then on Tuesday night, my infection started getting a whole lot better. So I'm now walking on my leg, feeling a whole lot better. But it felt for a while I had decay in my bones. I'd get up from my bed or my couch and I couldn't put my leg on the floor. That's how bad it was. Now, these are very physical, very bodily descriptors, aren't they, here in this psalm? That's how much David is impacted by what's going on between him and God when he's not confessing his sin. When he's holding out on God, if you like, it is devouring him from within. There's one phrase that describes what's happening actually between him and God in these verses 3 and 4. David says in verse 4, your hand was heavy on me. Now this is God's hand of conviction. It's not a hand of judgment, not yet. Uh, it's not, that's irreversible. It, it's not a hand of comfort either because the Lord's hand can be described as a hand of comfort, can be described as the mighty hand of salvation. It's not that either. God's hand can refer to all these different ways of God being present with us. But here, the heavy hand that's upon David is his loving hand of conviction. And we know much more about that uh, since the coming of Jesus and the pouring out of his spirit. When Jesus uh, was telling the disciples that he was going to die and go, 
He was going to leave a counsellor, the promised Holy Spirit. And in John chapter 16, that counsellor would convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. And no one likes that experience of conviction. I'm sure you don't like it. That can be a conviction by the Spirit. Our strength is sapped. Our bones feel like they're wasting away. God's hand is heavy on us. But God's intention is not just to make us feel awful. It's not like he's a cruel God who gets off on watching us suffer this internal torment of conviction and guilt. He convicts us of sin, not so that we would hide from him and suffer in silence, but so that we would draw near to him so that we would come to him confessing our sin and finding forgiveness. And that's what David does there in verse 5. He says, Then I acknowledge my sin to you, and I didn't cover up my iniquity. I said, I'll confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Uh, David has one of the most public failures, moral failures of any leader in history. Uh, You'll know what I'm talking about. Even though he lived 3,000 years ago, do you know any other moral failures of leaders 3,000 years ago? Probably not. Uh, Soon after he came to power, it seemed, and God made a covenant with David that he'd have a king on his throne forever, a dynasty that would last eternally. It seems like a few things went to David's head and he sinned terribly. Uh, When his men were off at war, uh, David stayed at home. And began to look lustfully at his neighbor's wife, Bathsheba. She bathed on the rooftop. And being the king, he'd become accustomed to being able to get whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted it. And so he had her brought to his house and he slept with her. And she fell pregnant. And so David began the tragic efforts of deception. He wanted to hide his sin, deceive all of those around him. Uh, He arranged for Uriah to come back from the battlefront so that he would sleep with his wife and then the child that Bathsheba was bearing would be a legitimate child of their marriage. But Uriah didn't sleep with her out of loyalty to the fighting men that he'd left behind on the battlefront. So David had him sent back and had him killed. He, He murdered his own man And then took Bathsheba as his wife so that the child would seem the legitimate child of their new marriage. It was the biggest cover-up. Great deception. He was hiding his sin, deceiving all those around him. And it was a miserable way to live. Uh, Caught in the web of his own sin and his lies. No genuine loving relationships with others around about him. And certainly no open, transparent relationship with the Lord. Were you can't cover up your iniquity you can't hide it from God he sees and knows all things so there's that terrifying verse in Hebrews chapter 4 isn't there that the word of God judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart it goes deep within and lays them bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account a passage like that it brings about the fear of the Lord doesn't it it was when Nathan the prophet rebuked David And pretty much dragged him into the light. That's when he acknowledged his sin. That's when he no longer covered up his iniquity. That's when he confessed his transgressions to the Lord. You can hear that language through um, in verse 5 there. Um, The Apostle John, after he was walking with Jesus for three years, uh, writes in his first epistle, chapter 1, This is the message we've heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there's no darkness at all. And if we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth's not in us. But if we confess our sins... His faithful and just will forgive us our sins and purify us from all righteousness. When you realise you can't hide from God, uh, then the only sensible option is to be transparent about what He already knows, acknowledge your sin, confess them, and then hide yourselves in Him. David takes this opportunity in in the psalm to then invite all his readers, all his hearers, to invite us uh, to come to this place of confession. Look there in verse 6. He says, Therefore let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely 
The mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You'll protect me from trouble and surround me uh, from uh, protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. I love here um, his, the phrase, uh, seek, uh, uh, pray to the Lord while he may be found. Can you hear that echo throughout the scriptures in other places? While he may be found. Isaiah pleads with the nation of Israel in Isaiah 55, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Well, the Apostle Paul to the Corinthians in chapter 2, and uh, sorry, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, he says, Today is the day of salvation. Of course, the Lord's always near to hear our confession, our cry of repentance, but there will come a day when his patience will run out, so to speak. That great and terrible day where Jesus says the door will be shut. There'll be no more access to the bridegroom and it will be time to give account. So call on him now, he's saying, while he may be found. Today is the day of salvation. There will come a time of judgment when it's too late for the confession and the forgiveness of sins. There is nowhere to hide from God. The only sensible thing to do is to hide ourselves in God. And I love the transition through the psalm. Did you notice uh, in, uh, in chapter 1, uh, uh, he says, Blessed is the one whose sins are covered. That is, covered over by God. He says, Though um, in, I did not acknowledge my sin, my bones wasted away, my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer, I, when I did not cover up uh, when he covered up his iniquity. So you can either try and cover up your sin yourself and hide from God, or you can acknowledge your sin and hide yourself in God, and he will cover over your sin. Forgiveness is an interesting thing, isn't it? It's not something that you see. You can't look out there in the street, people that you don't know, and go, this person is forgiven by God, and this person is not yet. You can't see that. Um, and forgiveness is uh, something that many don't actually experience as a blessing. They haven't come to Christ. So it would be true to say that wide is the road that leads to destruction. Narrow is the way that leads to life. So the forgiven person doesn't look much different on the outside. Still got four arms, uh, two arms, two legs, two eyes, four limbs. Forgiveness describes the status of relationship the hidden relationship, isn't it, between you and God. That it, it's about our status. And that's why I like the two other descriptors in verses 1 and 2. Let's take your eyes back to there to think about the forgiveness of sins. Um, it also is described as our sins being covered. We haven't covered them from God because we can't. But he has covered over them so that our record is without blemish. Or in verse 2, it says that the Lord does not count our sin against us. This is the great doctrine of justification by faith. We don't pretend we've never sinned. It's not that God doesn't see our sin, but it's that our sin doesn't count against us. In the court record, though we could have been declared guilty, the sentence comes down not guilty. In fact, even better than that, it comes down as righteous because the righteousness of Jesus is credited to our account. It's good to recall um, Pilgrim in John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, isn't it? He is burdened by the weight of sin. In all the picture books, you know, the weight of sin is just huge. And this is Christian. He goes on this journey to rid himself of this burden. Uh, he's guided by evangelist. And after many dangers, toils and snares, he comes to the cross. And there the burden of his sin is rolled away. And we've got hymns like that, haven't we? This is a wonderful state that we live in. It's the blessed state. We, we live in the light. It's not a matter of being sinless. It's a matter of living transparently before God. In this constant, day-by-day, day, humble state of a repentant state, confessing our sin when we become conscious of it, and seeking to be obedient children, living by God's Spirit, saying no to ungodliness, living self-controlled, godly, and upright lives. And all the way, knowing that Jesus has made us right with God. We're reconciled because of Him. We're in this open and living relationship with the Lord God Almighty, and it's all of an account of grace. And so we can have hope and a future, and it's secure, not by our efforts, 
but by his gift. It's the blessed life. It's a lovely place to be. We were sitting on the deck having dinner last night. Louise and I said, and uh, Lou kind of knew in the background that I was writing the sermon on forgiveness. I said, what does the forgiveness of sins mean to you? He just pauses and she says, everything. It's everything, isn't it? And we'll build on that just a little bit later. But this is the blessed state that we live, and it's a place that's open to instruction. In verse 8, David moves into the last part of his psalm, and he says, I'll instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I'll counsel you with my loving eye on you. Don't be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him. You see, once you're humbled... Under God's heavy hand, you're convicted that your way is wayward. And then you're brought into forgiveness and reconciliation with God. It's only natural then that we would want to be instructed in the way we should go. And David uses this illustration of the horse and the mule. And we know mules, um, belligerent animals, foolish animals, you can't really train them very well. Uh, They're quite stubborn. Horses, we feel, are a little bit more trainable. But David's context of the horse is the war horse. And in war, the rider has the strategy, doesn't he? The rider knows where he needs to position his horse in relation to his own cavalry and in relation to the enemy. A horse has no understanding really of that. And so they must be controlled by bit and bridle. Now, I don't know much about these things. The last time I was on a horse, uh, it completely bolted from the top of a paddock and ran down this hill and cleared this creek. And I was completely out of control, just trying to stay on the thing. It was running for this fence where its owner was. And the owner thought it was clearly going to jump the fence. And, um, and, but anyway, it pulled up just at the last, for which I was very thankful. So I have no idea. Um, so I decided to chat with Lindsay and Jan and uh, get instructed about bridles and bits. And they brought me around with all sorts of different bridles and bits and things that twisted and turned and those that didn't. And uh, they said, the more the horse and rider have trained together, like think, say, Olympic equestrian events, the less and less you need to use the bit in the mouth to control it. The more and more the horse and rider actually move together. And there's not a lot of control extended through the pain of the bit and bridle. There's a synergy between the horse and rider. David's saying, don't be like the horse or the mule that kicks against the rider. They have no understanding. They must be controlled by bit and bridle. Better we think of ourselves like a well-trained horse, seeking to move with the rider, not resisting the direction given. Once confessing our sin and knowing forgiveness, then we should want to keep in step with the Spirit. To walk in the light of the word, to hear and to heed his word in the scriptures. So Lou and I were chatting through these things last night. And I thought, well, look, I reckon this is going to be a really good exercise for everybody. So I'm going to give you a home assignment, okay? Switch your brain on, going to think about this. And we'll also put these things uh, in the email if if you don't. Can't take them in right now. But I wonder if over the next week you could sit down with a trusted Christian friend, uh, be it your spouse if you're living at home together with anyone, or a Christian friend or a parent. And with Psalm 20 open in front of you, reflect on these following questions. Do you sense the burden of sin from time to time? This is something to talk about with a Christian friend. Do you sense the burden of sin from time to time? That is, not all the time that you're completely weighed down and burdened, not finding the relief of forgiveness. And it's also not none of the time. That would be a terrifying thing as well if sin did not concern you at all. But do you sense the burden of sin from time to time? And here's a hard one. What are your prevailing sins? That's why it's a trusted Christian friend. Hopefully you can be open about that. If you can't be open with your trusted Christian friends about your prevailing sins, you've got to question whether you're really open with God about those things. What are your prevailing sins? And what does the forgiveness of sins mean to you? Put that into your own words. Louise says everything. And then she went to unpack that. It means hope. It means security. It means peace. It means a future. That were some of the things she shared. What does the forgiveness of sins mean to you? Going forward, how can you hear the instruction of God? Because you don't just want to say forgiven. We pray forgive us our sins and lead us not into temptation. 
going forward? How can you hear the instruction of God and how might you continue to walk in it? I love the fact that some people are taking a photo of that uh, with their camera. So they've got it before Wednesday when the email comes out. But there you go. Or you could just open Psalm 20. And because you've been listening so attentively, those things just fall out of the psalm for you and just chat about Psalm 20 uh, with some Christian, trusted Christian friend. Hmm? Oh, sorry. Where are we? 32. 20 was last week. I did move on. You're just thankful I didn't preach the same psalm again this week. 32. Psalm 32. There it is. Yeah. Um, there you go. So good conversation. Great, great fodder for conversation. Great um, fuel for powerful prayer. I'm going to close with verse 1 and verse 11. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing all who are upright in heart. And we'll do that in just a sec. Let's pray. Oh, Lord God, we thank you that you are a loving Father. And we thank you that you send your Spirit to convict us of sin. We thank you for the burden of sin because it reminds us that we need to come before you in humble repentance, trusting in your mercy offered to us in Christ Jesus. And we thank you that it is so freely and abundantly found there that he has satisfied your justice for us and has been raised again. Thank you, therefore, that our sins no longer count against us, but by grace and in contrast, his righteousness is imputed to us. Heavenly Father, help us uh, to be people who walk on seeking your instruction, uh, seeking to keep in step with the Spirit, to walk in the light of your word. uh, And help us, Lord God, to live uh, that life of open transparency in the light, uh, that we might rejoice and be glad, and that we might sing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's sing uh, Rejoice. All the